Good evening, everybody in Japan, or rather in East Asia, and good day to everybody overseas. It is a great pleasure to have you with us for today's seminar with Professor Dr. Patrick Zilkner and Mr. Dominic Ursprung. Let me introduce the two gentlemen to you. Professor Dr. Patrick Zilkner is a professor of sociology and lecturer in economic history at the University of Zurich and university counselor at the University of St. Gallen. He was responsible for bilateral economic relations with Japan and other East Asian countries at the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, SECO, from 2006 to 2009. That also involved him deeply with the setup of the FTA EPA between Switzerland and Japan. Later on, he was also involved in the Sino Swiss FTA when that was drafted. So, not surprisingly, his continued interest is with regional and bilateral free trade agreements and globalization. He has done extensive studies on East Asia and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and also wrote a book. Title in German, Regionale Integration Ostasien, Regional Integration East Asia. When scrolling through the internet, I found that Professor Tilner does also research in affiliation with Actelian Pharmaceuticals. Obviously, there is a lot more we could mention, but let's also introduce Mr. Dominic Ursprung. He was born in a 700 year old house in the center of Zurich and now being a lecturer at the International Management Institute of Zurich University of Applied Sciences, one could think that Mr. Ursprung is very entrenched in that part of Switzerland. However, in 2004, he moved to Geneva to study international relations. So that brought him also to Sophia University in Tokyo. After graduation, his affinity to Japan kept on growing in particular when getting a good look at how Japanese politics tick when working at Nagata Cho for an LDP member of the House of Representatives. And later on, when he supported several correspondents of the Yomiu regime group back in Switzerland in Geneva. Since 2016, Mr. Ursprung manages the office of Swiss Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry and is the secretary of the parliamentary group Switzerland Japan. Ongoing in his work for gaining, ongoing is his work for gaining a PhD at the Central University with a thesis on how Swiss watch companies in Shanghai have solved the shortage of skilled workers over there. With this, I think we have, we can say that we have two very, very knowledgeable speakers for today's topic. How should Switzerland react to the new mega regionals from Asia? Dominic and Patrick, welcome. Please give it to us. Thank you very much for your kind um, introductory uh, words. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to share some um, of the analysis that uh, Patrick and myself have been um, doing over the last um, few days or, or weeks, uh, in the case of uh, Patrick, of course, uh, years. Um, we, we thought this is a, an important um, moment um, to shed some light on the developments and, and the few ideas we have we have on uh, on this. Before I start, I would like to to clarify, just to be sure, it has been kindly um, mentioned in the introduction. Yes, I work at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, the School of Management and Law in Winterthur, which is my main activity. And through this work, I can manage the office of the Swiss Japanese Chamber of Commerce as a service mandate, which also includes uh, leading the secretariat of the parliamentary group, uh, Switzerland, Japan. Um, so of course it's related, but today mostly it's in my function at uh, ZHAW that uh, I will go through this uh, presentation and tap on other um, elements that are of course um, having a link um, here. Now, what we have done with this uh, graph, I guess you have seen it in the um, invitation. We, we try to create um, the right perspective 
that Switzerland has on those developments, the big um, mega regionals um, in Asia Pacific or actually beyond. It's uh, becoming a, a global thing, uh, basically, if we take uh, the decision from the UK into account to also join or yeah, apply to join um, uh, CPTPP. And I think this, this graph might be very helpful um, to, to, to put the right things um, at the right place and understand uh, what is actually happening. So the goal for today is kind of to, to go through the different elements with a focus on CPTPP um, uh, today and yeah, um, give, you, give you some uh, ideas on all those different um, elements. You see important for Switzerland, always keep in mind the distinction between what is happening bilaterally. You see here the links from Switzerland to China and to Japan, the two pioneer agreements and everything else that happens through EFTA as it is the case for the upcoming vote on um, the agreement with uh, Indonesia on the 7th of March in Switzerland. Now we, we will look at uh, CPTPP, but of course also TPP. Um, it, not no huge differences between the, the content of the two agreements. Then we take the Swiss um, uh, perspective, what is happening there, what, what are the risks that we are running in case of uh, inaction, what would be the opportunities. But of course, um, there are also the difficulties uh, or resistance, uh, I guess, in Switzerland from some sectors uh, when this uh, topic uh, comes up, we try to conclude with uh, with an outlook and then look very much forward to hopefully a lively discussion. Um, hopefully you will submit uh, many um, uh, questions. Now we've started, it's, it's a very simple approach. Of course it's simplified, but still I think it, it helps. Um, if we look at, well, talking about trading goods, the trade partners of um, uh, Switzerland. Um, we see here, I think it's roughly the top 20 partners that all those in green, we already have a kind of preferential um, agreement. All the EU members, um, but also with many other states, uh, EFTA of course has been uh, very uh, active. And you see, of course, very quickly, the big one missing is the United States. And of course, this matters in the context of a growing CPTPP where the United States might join again, given that they have been an important driving force. When it comes to Asia, you see here among the top 20, it's only Vietnam on the import side, um, which is kind of a missing uh, part. Of course, later, if you go further down, others are also missing, Indonesia, but they are all less than 1% of uh, total um, uh, share of imports or exports. So everything outside here is less than 1%. So it's just important to, to have this perspective in mind. If we talk now the vote on, on Indonesia, it's not about 5% of Swiss uh, trade, right? It's, it's a very small number, of course, with an important uh, impact on specific sectors. But the big picture is that um, what is missing is basically smaller parts of our trade um, uh, volume because mostly of course it's Europe, it's Asia, of course, Asia becoming um, uh, more important overall and the United States, which have been growing um, a lot. Um, but I think it's important to, to keep this in mind as a, a starting point for the analysis. Now, if you look at Asia, if we take this graph um, uh, apart, um, Yes, there have been those two pioneering agreements with Japan. First agreement between Switzerland, uh, uh, between Japan and the European state in uh, 2009. And then China also, the first one with a continental European state, if you want. So if we, if we do not uh, look at uh, Iceland, which has negotiated faster, but both uh, entered into force at the same time in uh, 2014. And here you see all the different um, EFTA agreements in um, Asia um, Pacific. So quite quite successful, I would say. Of course, it could be more, um, but it's not so it's not so bad here. Just as an, an overview, the starting point. Now the question, of course, and this is where Patrick has done a lot of research, and he will um, comment it in 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 a second. Of course, is then 
well, what are actually the benefits of those um, uh, agreements? And uh, this hasn't been that clear for a long time. Uh, Patrick has done a lot of uh, studies, but often specifically on, on some countries at a specific moment in time. But the overall view has been uh, missing for quite some time, which has caused quite, quite a process. Um, in the last few years, this has become a little bit uh, clearer. So here is, is a study. Um, I've taken this uh, graph. I think this has been compiled like, by um, the Volkswirtschaft, so the, the, the magazine uh, published by uh, ASECO. And, and this gives you an idea, right, about the utilization rate of the agreements and the, the savings that are actually possible when it comes to uh, imports and uh, exports. So overall, it looks not so bad. Um, but it's just extremely technical. Also, if you read this uh, study, there are so many um, exemptions and, and, and special things to, to take into consideration that it's just not so easy to have a very clear uh, picture here. But I'll let it to Patrick now maybe to explain this a bit more in detail. If we look at the case of Japan, what it actually means with the existing agreement and the utilization. Yes, thank you. I'm glad to I'm glad to jump in and also friendly greetings uh, from me out of the of Switzerland snow to our friends and colleagues in Tokyo, but also to our friends and colleagues from Jetro Geneva who joined uh, this meeting. I think this is a very timely topic. And just one sentence before I get into the details. Of course, we're all uh, preoccupied with the pandemic and uh, these delays and uh, a lot of things and preoccupies us uh, with other things. But the amazing thing for me in the last, let's say, 12 months or 24 months is that while Europe and the US are self-concerned and kind of stagnating, there are no larger initiatives coming out of the West, East Asia is integrating. So that's a very important message. And I think this is the main background also of our discussion today. The world is not standing still, especially in East Asia, Asia Pacific region. There are integration projects moving on, and this is changing our perspective. So as Dominic has shown, we are, we can say, in a comfortable position with a lot of free trade agreements, bilateral or in the EFTA context, but the world outside us is changing more quickly. So it would be wrong to say we are comfortable, we don't have to watch this, we don't have to move within this, but the world is changing faster outside the West and not many people realize that. Also, RCEP was a kind of shock for many people in Europe. They did not expect this kind of thing happening. And this wider context leads to our main questions. <clears throat> so I was glad to do this uh, very detailed research on the utilization of uh, the free trade agreement uh, economic partnership agreement uh, with Japan. And the big, the first question I started with is that many companies came to me and they told me, yes, we are in favor of this agreement. We really favor your initiative, but in my case, it's not really working. So that's when I started this kind of utilization research. And the good news, what you see here is that 88% of Swiss exports to Japan are already tariff free. So in the main areas, like the MEM areas, mechanical electrical industry, but also watches, there are no tariffs applied. So Japan is really an open and free trade oriented country. And those area, those sectors which are affected most, especially textile and food industries. And I think that's important, not only because I come from the eastern part of Switzerland, which has historically been the center of textile industry, but because there is still textile industry in Switzerland, which is a kind of miracle. And of course, food is also very important. And here we have also room for improvement. I mean, there are still some uh, quotas or tariffs applied, and here we can still do some improvements. And the good news, of course, is that because our agricultures are very different, Japanese and Switzerland's agriculture. So actually we have, do not really have uh, problems in the agricultural area. We move on. Now, when I started to study CPTPP, for me, the most amazing aspect was that when the result of the negotiation was presented in Washington, but also in Tokyo, there was no mentioning of free trade. So this was very interestingly, not about free trade mainly. So what is it about? And I quote 
uh, President Obama, what he said, we have to make sure America writes the rules of the global economy, and we should do it today, while our economy is in the position of global strength, because if we don't write the rules for trade around the world, guess what, China will. And very similar, next quote, uh, I quote Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, in 2016, the TPP agreement is the first step of a great challenge to disseminate economic rules suitable for the 21st century throughout the world. So this is the, the center on rules. This is about rule setting, obviously. This is the main thing. It is. It has a global approach and it's obviously something that has to be developed further. So it's very clear this is not a kind of uh, reaction integration as a reaction or an exclusive integration, but this is a kind of open project which starts regionally, but was from the beginning uh, aimed at going global. And that's why this is highly relevant for Switzerland and for Swiss uh, companies. Please, Dominic. Yes, we, we just put this together very briefly. So how, how the process went on. So obviously uh, 10 years until the negotiations have been concluded for this original TPP uh, 12 with the United States, as you have seen it uh, before. Um, and then at the beginning of 2016, uh, basically the, the ceremony to, to, to celebrate um, this um, agreement. Then Japan, of course, was quite uh, fast, You're celebrating, ratifying the agreement on the 20th of January 2017. So everybody was um, happy. You see also flag of the United States um, still here. Um, and this would have looked like this. I think quite interesting that I, I had to take the, the template here from our Western academic institution. Uh, so you see kind of the the Pacific uh, on the outside, um, but I think it's not so bad. Uh, the, the map had a comeback if we uh, include uh, the UK, but it shows a little bit kind of what we talk about, um, how this all um, uh, got started indeed uh, at the beginning with this uh, year, kind of connecting uh, states around the Pacific, which is where global trade is happening. It's not across the Atlantic anymore, but shifting uh, of course um, to the other side um, of the world. And uh, Patrick here made this analysis, I think uh, pointing out a key element if we want to understand what has actually happened with this agreement. Yeah, when you try to assess an agreement like uh, the CPTPP, first you have to develop this kind of uh, matrix because you have to check out which bilateral economic relations have been conducted under free trade conditions already. So what you see, this is the light green, there are uh, FTAs already in place. And you see for some countries, for example, Singapore already had with all TPP members free trade relations. So it would be wrong to have an economic modeling which like uh, simulates a big bang in free trade. This is not the case. So this is, the important thing is not that, and you see especially what are the big fish in here. And of course, the main economic relation, which was not conducted under free trade um, conditions, was the relation between Japan and the US. So that was, of course, the single most important aspect in CPTPP, even if later everything uh, was different, but this was the main aspect. But beyond this, it's very important to say this is an attempt at multilateralization of rules. And this is very important because also in Switzerland, we got used to the bilateral perspective. And I think we have done a good job. Switzerland is, uh, has many uh, bilateral uh, agreements or in the EFTA context in place. But what we see now, this might well in 10 years or in 20 years, look as the beginning of multilateralization of rules. And I think it's quite obvious why Switzerland should be at the table of this multilateralization of rules. Well, then I think what you all know happened, um, Japan ratified, but just three days later in the United States, um, we had a slightly different 
um, situation. Um, New Zealand actually also later ratified this original agreement, uh, but with the withdrawal of the United States, um, yeah, uh, basically the, the, the air was gone. Um, one of the first actions the, um, um, that uh, President Trump has taken, it was one of his big promises during the campaign, so not really a surprise. Um, but yeah, you, you see a clear action um, on, yeah, on the, the campaign. Uh, the United States are not part of it anymore. I'm not sure if it was only Obama that uh, was kind of uh, part of kind of yeah this uh, project, obviously, um, or if they have done any analysis in terms of uh, content that they did not agree with. But anyway, uh, so with this, the the first attempt was certainly uh, blocked, and the perspective was was pretty bad um, at that uh, time. Yet it was not the end of the, the project. Um, already in May, new discussions uh, started. How could this uh, deal be, be saved, uh, given all the commitments, the, the, the 10 years of negotiations? So uh, a big, of, big investment has been uh, done. And they managed, indeed, to conclude the discussions. And a new signing ceremony then in the beginning of uh, 2018. And actually at the end of uh, 2018, so the agreement was implemented, uh, at least among those uh, members. And it was again time to celebrate even without a participation of the United States. So this is how TPP 11 uh, became CPTPP uh, 2018. So this is a bit kind of the, the history um, behind it. Now, what is very interesting, I think Patrick will comment on this uh, afterwards, but I think there has been uh, an, an interview um, in the Asahi Shimbun um, a few weeks ago, and I think it, it shows very well kind of what has been the mindset of Japan um, behind all that. Um, and I think it's quite well uh, explained here um, that Japan thought the, the time of the bilateral treaties um, is, is over, that um, they have used it to a maximum extent and that something new is starting now. And that, for instance, in the agricultural sector, reform was inevitable anyway. But if they link it here to this project, um, then you can gain uh, additional things because anyway, you have to do those uh, reforms. If you can get some market access outside for that, uh, why not doing it, right? They, they thought the time of asking for market access abroad while not being uh, willing to further open uh, protected market at home, they thought this time is over, right? Um, and I think in Switzerland, of course, I think the overall mindset is no, we're still in this time um, asking for more abroad while not opening up uh, uh, that much. And I think her statement also shows that it was a unique situation where Japan has taken over the lead. The United States have left, but Japan said, no, we want this deal. We, uh, we try to keep it together. It's very interesting if you look at the comparison between TPP and CPTPP. Many chapters have not been opened. It's a few dozens of pages, pages of uh, differences, but they knew once you start opening those different packages, it will become a mess and possibly the whole thing will fall apart. So I guess this was the only maybe radical way, but it was possibly the only way um, to save the deal. And, and Japan took over an interesting leadership function in this context. But Patrick, you can maybe add to this. Yes, it's uh, really amazing. And I've been very impressed. I was lucky to be uh, in Tokyo in the early 2000s. And uh, I was lucky to meet uh, Munakata-san in person and to, had to conduct interviews with her about uh, emerging bilateralism in trade policy of Japan. <clears throat> and there was a long way. Japan has always been uh, very much WTO oriented, of course, and has did not join the trend of bilateralism for a long time. She was... Um, uh, participating in the negotiations with Singapore, the first pioneering uh, free trade agreement that uh, Japan uh, concluded. And this is about 20 years later, you know, so from a, from a very uh, tentative and very cautious approach to use bilateralism and to develop a more proactive role. And now 20 years later, Japan uh, 
had this proactive leadership in the in the TPP context. So I was very lucky to be in the situation to follow this development. And that was one of the things that really made me think about this, that um, yes, this is a table we should sit at because otherwise we are on the menu. So then here you have the picture, I think of this, uh, uh, yeah, the new reality that is actually um, indeed implemented. And the new map, basically just with the United States um, missing. Uh, not all members have yet ratified the agreement, but you see um, those in uh, Latin America are missing, um, Malaysia and Brunei are missing but uh, everybody else has ratified the agreement, so it could enter uh, into force and has become a uh, reality. Now, Patrick will uh, briefly explain then now the, the content um, of the uh, original agreement. Yes, the most important thing, of course, what is a partnership? What does that mean in uh, trade policy terms? Most important, it's a, it's a plurilateral agreement so it's not multilateral in the sense that it's at global level with more or less all WTO members uh, uh, integrated. It's voluntary, it's geographically defined, but with a global approach. So that's the specifics. So we have usually these kind of agreements. This is a kind of regional club with preferential relations among members. And this is not, this does not stand in opposition to WTO rules because this kind of club memberships, this kind of regional integration is foreseen and is clearly not violating WTO rules. So what we find here is a corpus of hard and soft legislation. Of course, in the center is an abolishment of tariffs in sensitive areas over 10 years or more. And um, CPTPP is, um, how to say, a, quite a cautious approach. For example, if you look at the, the, the tariff abolishment for, uh, for Japanese cars going to the US, this is a very, very long time period. So this is definitely not a free trade big bang, but of course it will improve market access. So there's a whole body of new rules, extended rules or amended rules. And the challenge for the analysis is what goes beyond WTO, what goes in services area, what goes beyond guts, what goes beyond the, glob uh, the, the uh, global procure procurement agreement, what goes beyond in uh, intellectual property, what goes beyond the TRIPS agreement, and that's how you define it. So a lot of things is just a confirmation of WTO roles and this plus element, this is the most important thing. So we have a kind of dual nature. We have a liberalization aspect on the, on the one side, but we have these common rules aspect member which have been stressed by the political leaders after the conclusion of the negotiations. And that's how it looks like. So this is a quite comprehensive uh, agreement, especially if you compare it, for example, with uh, RCEP. So I don't want to, want to go in details. In many regards, this is an up-to-date agreement as many uh, free trade agreements uh, they have similar structures, similar content, especially important. Uh, let me uh, just stress two or three things. We have a chapter on state-owned enterprises and designated monopolies. That's something you do not have in uh, RCEP. You have a quite interesting labor chapter. So these are uh, related to ILO conventions, but even going beyond. So there's a quite interesting uh, implementation mechanism from the Swiss point uh, of view, this is important. This is much more than we could ever implement in a bilateral agreement with any country, because this is where the US under Obama, uh, they put a lot of stress on, on these areas. I will come back to this in a second. There's also an environment chapter. And of course, also intellectual property is much more. Of course, uh, we have to deal with the topic of agriculture. As you know, this is uh, the Achilles heel of uh, Switzerland. That's where we have most of the problems, not in industrial area or with, uh, with rules or intellectual property. So that's why I, I analyzed the TPP in detail, the original TPP. And I was quite uh, surprised to find a rather modest liberalization level since there are some of the big agricultural exporters involved in TPP. US, Australia, and also New Zealand, 
but the result was actually a quite modest liberalization level because there were some countries in, in the TPP negotiations with, which uh, had and still have a protectionist system and they remained in place. So the most uh, important aspect is usually this is about higher quotas. For example, Australian sugar exports to do yes, not liberalized, but higher quota. So again, here we do not really have free trade, but we have a system of quotas. And the most important example for us, of course, we studied that from a Swiss perspective, was the case of Canada. Canada has a, a so-called supply management program and quite comprehensive in the agricultural area. That means this is a control of production, control of prices, control of imports. And if you look at this, they have a tariff rate quotas, new tariff rate quotas, for example, 3.25 of dairy production, 2.1 of chicken production, 2% of the turkey production, and so on. So if you look at the details, this is not, again, not a big bang in agriculture, but it's just a kind of modification of uh, existing agricultural policies. And of course, that's a very important news. As you know, the domestic political discussion in Switzerland, this is good news, which means TPP that would not end our agricultural policy. And that's how Obama sold the agreement. And of course, he had uh, quite, uh, strong domestic opposition also in his own political camp, but that's why, that's how he tried to sell it. President Obama's trade deal enforces American values that past trade deals did not. For example, a ban on child and forced labor was not in NAFTA, but it's in TPP. There are uh, conditions about um, a minimum wage in TPP. This is a ban on workplace discrimination. This includes the right to form a union and bargain collectively. There are, uh, is a regulation of workplace safety and also trade sanctions for violating labor rights. So that's how he tried to sell it to his domestic audience. And of course, this is very important for, uh, for a Swiss perspective also. And he called it the largest enforcement of enforceable labor rights in history. So I think that's interesting because unfortunately our agreements are not a strong mechanism, not a strong instrument to put forward all of these uh, uh, aspects, but they are in, in CPTPP. So that's, I think, from a Swiss perspective, very good news. So concluding my analysis, I bring this down to these four or five points. It's not a big bang in liberalization. In many regards, it's a rather a negotiated or managed liberalization, taking into account uh, vested interests. So from an economic policy point of view, this is not everywhere good news, you know, so the things should be reformed. But of course, it's a beginning. And of course, vested interests are important in this kind of negotiations. So we have this dual nature of competitive liberalization, but also competitive rule setting. And the thing, of course, is if these high level trade rules become the global standard, this could be, then they should be reformed. Some of it is too difficult or too restrictive from an economic policy point of view, but reality is uh, always different. And there will be more choices, yes, but there will also be a limited usability. That's where we we have to analyze this critically also from in the, in, in the interest of uh, Swiss companies. And as it is now, TPP is crisscrossing, is also fragmenting established economic integration areas, which is a problem. For example, ASEAN trying to uh, build a common market, but of course TPP includes some of ASEAN members and others not. I think that's the big disadvantage compared to a, an approach like in RCEP. And we are going to have, we, uh, we will see some aspects of trade diversion that's unavoidable. And some countries will be winners. Vietnam, for example, is experiencing an investment boom, um, not being only member of uh, ASEAN, RCEP, but also member of CPTPP. Now the question of course is then, uh, or the big um, di distinction between RCEP and uh, CPTPP is that yes, it's it's open, right? Um, 
from from the design i think the, the accession process has uh, been changed a little bit from tpp to cptpp um, but basically every state or also customs territory can uh, join uh, the deal this has also been confirmed i think at this uh, meeting in mexico a virtual um, a meeting where they said well whoever can meet um, the high standards um, of the agreement um, is very welcome um, uh, to join so this is the official position it's also the official position of uh, Japan, I guess, towards um, uh, Switzerland. Um, and now we can already see the first uh, process, which has um, started at the beginning of um, February, when uh, the UK uh, announced its, um, its, its interest. They, uh, first, you have to deal with New Zealand, uh, the depository state of the agreement, and then start uh, talks with, uh, with all um, the different members. So certainly not an easy process um but i think a process that i think we should certainly watch uh, carefully um because it might have some indications of course with brexit it's a bit of a tricky uh, situation um but it's from a european uh, context nonetheless which uh, might have some uh, learnings for uh, switzerland potentially now the big thing here is that it's a club and you would like to join this club and similar to the WTO, well, the club members can decide if they allow you to join or not. On the UK, there has be, there's an existing study, very extensive uh, that I have linked here, a roadmap for UK accession to CPTPP. Um, and their conclusion is basically that it's it sounds to me like uh, EU accession. It's not a negotiation about the text. The text is fixed. And it's mostly about how do you make sure or that you can fulfill the different uh, requirements and what kind of deals do you conclude with all the different existing uh, members? So the side um, uh, agreements or is, are there some specific exceptions? Um, I think so you can change a few things, uh, but nothing um, uh, dramatic. I think the dramatic thing here is maybe the, the schedules with the existing members. Um, I think this is where you have um m most uh, possibilities to have an impact uh, basically or win some time um to yeah to enter this deal but this i think is is, is certainly a big challenge and we don't know yet how this will uh, work out in in practice so this is this is new um to all of this and uh, quite a few questions that we have addressed in the short analysis we have uh, published firstly here on on china um, I think it's quite interesting that the former negotiator of uh, China's accession to the WTO um, said, well, Vietnam and Singapore are also part of this deal. And if they manage to implement this agreement, China can also do this. I guess, particularly Vietnam, right? Um, so he's quite optimistic. Um, and I think he, he he's using a, a similar logic as he has used when he brought China into the WTO. Um, there's a lengthy interview with WTO spokesperson uh, Keith Rockwell, where he explains, well, it was about bringing domestic reforms to China through joining uh, WTO. So it's kind of a, a thing you join to advance domestic reform. And it seems the mindset at the moment is the same. Also at the top of the country, so China's leader Xi Jinping also said China is actively considering joining uh, CPTPP. And it seems he also has in mind that this is a good tool to advance domestic reform. Uh, an interesting move apparently is also that um, the former ambassador of China to the WTO in Geneva, he has uh, a new very important uh, function uh, now at uh, MOFCOM, even in the role of uh, vice minister of uh, commerce since December uh, 2020. Um, it, it was already announced in, in November. So I think if, if you look at this uh, timing, I think that's quite interesting. Um, that now those uh, people from the WTO context are now kind of in important uh, positions and they all say, this is what we are going to do. So will it happen? Well, of course we don't know, um, but indications are that this should be taken seriously. Now, when we try to figure out how New Zealand looks at all of this, um, here is a former trade diplomat of uh, New Zealand. Um, 
And this is the image when he was asked how this is going to work out with the UK joining, and he seems very happy. He said, for once we have leverage. They have quite a lot of demands to the UK, um, and now they, yeah, they will they will ask for for they will come up with their wish list because they are a club member, and whoever wants to join basically has to to meet the the criteria, right? Similar to Russia wanting to join the WTO, and Georgia came up with all kind of requirements and and requests that they had to meet. Um, this kind of situation can really change the the power of uh, of, of states um, and, and shift leverage for a limited period of time. But this can make entry more painful, and this is why we came to the conclusion in our analysis: the earlier you join, uh, the better, because there are less states that will come up with sometimes difficult. Uh, demands that you have um, to meet. So this is how club members look when new states uh, line up and want to join the party. Now we've added this also to the with the Swiss um, uh, perspective, same logic as Patrick has um, explained um, before, and you see that indeed, uh, assuming the United States come back, come back. So of course this would also here be kind of the the big thing. Um, for Swiss-US uh, relations, but also Vietnam would be new, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Brunei, and Malaysia. Yes, of course, in some cases, there are ongoing negotiations, um, but also for Switzerland, you see, it would be five new deals, uh, if we take here this kind of simplified uh, measure. So also for Switzerland, this would be quite significant. Patrick, you want to add? Yes, I think that makes the situation uh, quite clear. And just let me uh, share with you one more uh, kind of a strategic thought. It, it, as I mean, all Swiss companies and all Swiss diplomats and politicians know that the biggest challenge is, of course, the US for Switzerland by far. And this is a very unique situation right now. So if uh, the US joins CPTPP again, then we have to meet the demands by the US. If Switzerland joins before, the US has to get into talks with Switzerland. Imagine that, it's hard to imagine a more positive situation uh, to get into a trade deal with uh, the second biggest economy in the world. Consider that as a kind of historic chance. So we've summarized this briefly here, but I'll jump over this that we can keep uh, the time. So this is once again, this uh, overall um, uh, picture. And I think the, the, the big thing to keep in mind here is really CPTPP is dynamic, right? So yes, you have the current analysis. You see basically what is missing. It's the five states here um, that are missing. If we, if I put this here, right? So they are missing, but with two of them, negotiations um, are um, uh, ongoing. So probability that we could, or Switzerland could get an agreement at, uh, at some moment. So it looks not so dramatic, but if you consider that the, the UK might join, um, uh, the, the US might uh, join, and China might also um, uh, join this club, then it's a very different situation, right? So I think this is kind of the thing to, consider maybe becoming a bit more um, uh, proactive uh, because if if all your important partners join the party and you are out of it, um, yeah, you might find yourself in a, uh, a difficult situation. And we can also link this, of course, to the existing free trade agreement between Switzerland and uh, Japan. Um, I've mentioned at the beginning, it's from 2009. Um, and all attempts to update the agreement, this is what the parliamentary group Switzerland Japan has mentioned many times, to, uh, supported by the Chamber of Commerce, um, that there is a need to update this um, uh, agreement. And several federal council have visited um, Japan, but so far, at least we don't see any um, uh, progress, right? Um, and there are implications of just keeping the status quo. That's um, uh, that has an impact um, as well. And I'll show one example here very briefly. The EU got a very good deal with uh, Japan. Um, and this impact is, is felt now. So this is kind of a really up-to-date new data, basically. Um, and you see with the data available today, um, 
the EU agreement with Japan is now enforced for two years and they got basically tariff-free access now for uh, cheese exports to Japan. And for Switzerland, this means it's going down. Cheese exports to Japan are suffering dramatically. Um, if you look at the developments over the last three years and also the last just two years, um, while at the same time, exports from the EU go up by 13%. Exports in uh, cheese from Germany to Japan went up 35% last year, while Switzerland is losing this, uh, this market, right? So this is, uh, of course, a very difficult um, uh, situation. If this agreement is not updated, we might see maybe similar developments in other fields where Swiss exporters um, uh, struggle and have difficulties to, to even keep um, a, a reasonable uh, market share. So therefore, all alternative has to be considered. If the bilateral agreement cannot be updated, well, the other option is uh, CPTPP, right? There are not hundreds of options. And uh, I guess it makes sense to, to seriously uh, consider the few options um, on the table. So it's minus uh, almost 13% on the Swiss side. Now, the, the parliamentary group, which of course is a tool for what we hear in the chamber, but also the chamber's thinking ahead of what might happen to kind of connect this with uh, uh, politics, where National Councillor Schneider Schneider and also Vice President uh, Thierry Burkhardt um, are very uh, helpful to have an open ear to, to concerns that uh, are around. Um, and the, the Federal Council has been asked if this would indeed be an, uh, an option that Switzerland would join um, CPTPP. And now this reply has been uh, published a few days um, ago and I've put it together here um, very um, uh, briefly. You see on the left side basically arguments for yeah, why there is no need to, to change all that, um, as I've mentioned before. So, um, well, yeah, there will be negative effects, um, of course, um, in, in some of these, those markets that would be a reality for Swiss exporters, of course, in, in all of those markets, but particularly um, here. But of course, the Federal Council hopes that trying to update the existing agreements might still lead to some success, although there has the success so far is quite limited. Turkey has been one success story, if you want so. Um, and particularly here, of course, um, this is um, a big concern in the US market. I think Patrick has analyzed this in, in, in detail. Uh, if the US comes back, Swiss companies might face, uh, face very tough Japanese competition in the US market. And of course, immediately in the short term, the priority is getting a majority for the free trade agreement with Indonesia on the 7th of March and moving on with negotiations with Malaysia and uh, Vietnam, right? But this is very far away from the spirit we have shown in Japan, where they said, we need a completely new um, approach. Um, and on the right side, you see the, the reservations, but maybe Patrick, do you want to comment on them before we conclude? Yes, Swiss succession to the CPTPP would help to eliminate discrimination. And um, some of the questions that were uh, given into the chat room already, they, they, they focus on this. So can we say, are we in a comfortable situation because we have bilateral agreements with, uh, with most of the members that so we can say, okay, we are on the safe side. We have our kind of insurance against all of this. I think this would be a mistake. So right now, this would not hurt on many markets. But as I said, Switzerland, which has done such an historically important job in developing the WTO rules. I mean, compared to the size of the economy of Switzerland, it has a, a, a quite higher uh, political influence. So um, this is a chance to develop these rules further. So that's that would be interesting and there will be a dynamic. And also that's part of this kind of a trade policy game. You know, first movers have an advantage. And right now we have here not the very first, but like the, we could be part of the second generation. But of course there are major challenges, that's right. I mean, not only in agriculture, also this is a, a US and well, you can say Asia Pacific dominated a set of rules, which is different from what we are used uh, in the EU or in the EFTA context, but we have to get used to it. And you see here this kind of uh, uh, picture here, you know, that's the, the famous uh, spaghetti 
uh, bowl or noodle bowl in Asia uh, of crisscrossing agreements. And Switzerland has been very active in uh, the proliferation of these kind of agreements as a kind of speedboat in world trade. But we have to remind ourselves that it was always the idea to go from that going multilateral again. And there are not many instruments right now uh, available, but CPTPP is one of these. So CPTPP could play a key role, a key function in this kind of multilateralization of these uh, crisscrossing uh, trade agreements, which we have been doing so successfully for some time, but we should not uh, lose the goal of attempting at the multilateralization of these kind of rules. Excellent. I think we, we conclude here, coming back to our initial graph, and I think very happy to take questions. Thank you. Dear gentlemen, thank you very much for this very insightful and uh, overall um, introduction of the topic and also uh, elaborating on it. We are almost out of time, but just one question to, to conclude this a little bit. Um, you mentioned many other, well, several other applicants, com well, countries that will be interested in, in joining or might be interested in joining the CPTPP club, um, the UK, the USA, China. What is in for the CPTPP to let Switzerland join or to even take up negotiations with Switzerland before the other applicants? Yep, that's a good point, of course. Um, um, you may say that uh, market access to the Swiss market is easy. And as I said, many have bilateral free trade agreements with Switzerland or EFTA already. So usually it's not market access, but it's uh, Switzerland's role also in, in rules making. So Switzerland has a very well established uh, role in the WTO. And as some people that I conducted interviews with said, it's, it's also quite attractive to have the, the Swiss seal on it. You know, it's like a kind of quality standard, you know, so we are going global and globally oriented economies like the Swiss economy is, is a member uh, of this. So I think that's quite interesting. And I also tell you openly, we have a lot of friends in the ministries of agriculture all over the world because we are not aggressive agricultural exporters. So they love us for that because we are, do, we are not troublemakers in this area. I think that's a perfect uh, summary to, to finish this presentation. Thank you very much for also answering the question beforehand already integrated in your presentation. And just for a few closing remarks, we will hand the microphone back to our president. Okay, Patrick and Dominic, thank you very much for this very insightful presentation. It's definitely just the tip of the iceberg you were able to touch on because it's so deep in the topic. For example, as you mentioned, the, the Japan-Swiss uh, trade agreement, we as Swiss, we of course are very keen to actually update the agreement because the EU-Japan agreement is much more attractive for the EU. On the other hand, uh, the trade agreement we have with Japan, it's basically negative for the Japanese. So what can we really offer to actually have them talk to us and make a compromise that we also get the same special deals the EU is getting. So obviously, this is going to be a very, very tough one for Switzerland to upgrade. But anyway, and we continue to talk will maybe lead to something we very much hope we get there eventually. And also, of course, uh, not only bilateral, but multilateral. And so I wish you lots of luck with this and also lots of energy because it's a long way to go. Thank you very much. And everybody else, you have listened in and hope that you also benefited from it as much as I did. Thank you very much, Patrick and Dominic. With this, I would like to close. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Bye-bye.